So has the economy hit bottom? Did the Obama stimulus plan really make the difference? And does the Republican Party really have a new comprehensive health care alternative? All questions for the House Republican leader, John Boehner, who's with us exclusively this Sunday. Do you share the vice president's assessment? Have we hit bottom? I don't think anybody knows whether we've hit bottom. Now, the one thing I do know is that there's no model uh, for estimating how many jobs could have been saved or created as a result of the stimulus package. Uh, all I know are the facts. The president said uh, that when he signed the bill that unemployment would not exceed 8%. Now we have unemployment nearly 10%. He also said uh, that uh, jobs would be created immediately, and the fact is they haven't. Uh, most of the so-called jobs that have been saved or created are government jobs, even though the president promised that 90% of these jobs uh, would be private sector jobs. Three million Americans have lost their jobs since the stimulus was signed into law. And yes, the economy grew last month. Uh, but after a trillion dollars uh, of an economic stimulus plan was spent, uh, probably another seven or eight trillion dollars that the, that the Fed has pumped into the economy, I would hope that we've seen some economic growth. Uh, but Americans all around the country continue to ask the question, where are the jobs? And so the vice president says it grew because of the stimulus. You opposed the stimulus. Your party opposed the stimulus. Stand by that vote, or was it a mistake? Was that spending necessary to do something? That spending in the stimulus bill did nothing more than grow government. Republicans had a better solution. Uh, that would have cost half as much uh, and created twice as many jobs, according to a model created by the president's own the chairwoman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, and this was a, about allowing the American people, families and small businesses, to keep more of what they earned. We were, really would have gotten the economy going. And the problem we're having is that small businesses uh, and large businesses are sitting on their hands. Why? They're seeing a government here in Washington was spending this out of control, a national energy tax, uh, a nationalization of our health care uh, delivery system, and higher taxes on the horizon. And so business people are afraid to invest in their business, afraid to grow their business because they don't know what's going to happen next. Let me ask you, uh, I want to move on to health care, but let me ask you one question about that. One, one of the things that has people nervous out there is increasing federal deficits. And there's a story in the New York Times today that the administration might be warming to an idea that for 10 months it has flatly resisted. And that is some sort of a bipartisan commission, get together, look at how to reduce the deficit. You'd have to deal with entitlement reforms there. And the one proposal on the table from Senator Ken Conrad and Republican Senator Judd Gregg is have one of these commissions. They come up with recommendations. Congress would have to vote up or down. No amendments. Would you sign on to something like that, knowing that one recommendation would likely be some higher taxes. Uh, I've uh, co-sponsored a, a bill by Representative Frank Wolf from Northern Virginia that would create such a commission. Uh, I am concerned that the answer is going to be we're going to raise taxes. But I do agree that we have to get our arms around this deficit. We've got to get our arms around growing entitlement programs. Uh, but before we get to creating this commission, why don't we do something about the spending that's going on right now? It's out of control. You can't have trillion dollar deficits for as far as the eye can see, and that's what the budget is that's been passed uh, by the liberals here in Washington. But you would, you would accept that commission if it was structured in a way you were comfortable with it to try to take the politics out of that debate going forward. I assume the Ab timeline Absolutely, up. because these entitlement programs are not sustainable. The American people know they're not sustainable. Baby boomers have made promises to each other that our kids and grandkids can't afford. And it's time to do something about it. Let's move on to health care. And I know you brought something with you, and it's more than 1,900 pages, and that is the House Democratic Health Care Bill. Before we get to that, I want to hold up something else. This is the text of your radio address. It's two pages. Now, this was an effort by the Republican Party to say we have alternatives. It's not a bill. I want to be fair to you. But it lays out a number of things you would like to do in the Republican Party. What it does not do, and what that does, even though you don't like it in 1,900 pages, it lays out what they would do. It says how much it would cost. The Congressional Budget Office has said at the end what percentage of people would be covered. Where is the Republican proposal where you can say the American people will spend this much over 10 years, it will do this to the deficit, and when we're done, X percent of the American people will have health insurance? You can go to healthcare.gop.gov uh, and see our eight or nine ideas about how to make our current health care system. But they're separate better. pieces of they're legislation right now. Will, will, you, will you have what something I, to stack what, next to that? What I am hopeful for is to take these eight or nine ideas and put together in a bill uh, that's being scored right now by the Congressional Budget Office uh, and, and present it on the House floor during this debate. Uh, and I'm hopeful that Speaker Pelosi will, will allow us to offer an alternative. But what we do is we try to make the current system work better. 
We take a step-by-step -step approach by allowing people to buy insurance across state lines, allowing small businesses and other groups of individuals to group together for the purpose of buying health insurance at lower costs like big businesses and unions can. Uh, we need to do something about junk lawsuits. Uh, I think that uh, one of our proposals uh, is to allow, give grants to states who have innovative programs uh, to, uh, to help bring down the cost of health insurance. And 34 states today uh, have high risk pools for those with pre-existing conditions. Uh, we want to encourage all states to have these, and we put more money uh, into these high risk pools uh, so that we can bring down the cost of health insurance. And at the end of the day, what we're doing with our proposal is lowering health care insurance premiums, lowering cost, and expanding access. But the perception out there is, and the Democrats have fed this, and I understand that, and I've read some of the separate proposals Republicans have, but that you don't have a comprehensive plan. Here's a question we had on Twitter. Where is the magical Republican plan, Mario asked. Where's the magical Republican health care bill? I've looked on Google and nothing. How do you deal with the perception out there fed by the Democrats that you do not have, you have several proposals, but you don't have one where you can say, let's go through all the issues right here? Well, the Democrats don't have one either. I mean, we just saw this first bill. This is the first real bill, one bill that we've seen from the Democrats in the House. 1,990 pages. That ought to tell you all that you need to know, uh, that we're going to have 1,990 pages of legislation. The word shall exist in this bill 3,425 times. Shall. That means you must do. The Republican proposals have been on healthcare.gop.gov since June. Uh, we've talked about them, and we've talked about we're going to continue to talk about them. But it's a common sense approach to make the current system work better. We do not attempt to cover 46 million more Americans. Uh, we, will, we will cover millions more Americans, but we don't attempt to do this. But how this many is more? not affordable. The American people want to know how many more. This, this, what this is going to do is bankrupt America. It's going to cost millions of Americans their jobs. Uh, and cut benefits for seniors. This is not what the American people want. Where they you, want a more gradual approach uh, to fixing our current system. Where do you draw the line? You were a key player negotiating with the late Senator Edward Kennedy on No Child Left Behind when you had the Education Committee in the House. And that bill has some shells in it, too. It has some federal mandates. So, so the government does have a role. You've acknowledged that in past legislation. Where is your line in health care in the sense that the Republican Party is the party of states' rights? You believe Washington is too strong? Let the states make decisions. If you could get an opt-in public option, it's a little confusing. I want to explain it to our viewers, but not a public option where states have to make a decision to get out but a, pub, a national health care bill that said if states wanted to create a public option, they could do so on their own. Could you vote for that? Well, they already can. You know, many states, we've got Massachusetts has a plan uh, that they've enacted. Tennessee uh, has enacted their own plan. No public there plan in of, Massachusetts. There are, there are a lot of innovative uh, programs out there in the states. And I frankly think that we could help those programs work better. And so you will have a proposal. I just want to clear this. And we are going to have a proposal. You will have a proposal. And I hope that the speaker... Uh, will allow us to have a debate and a vote on our proposal. And it will be a bill. I'll be able to stack oh, the, two up, eight, the two up side by side. You can go to healthcare.gop.gov and look at the eight or nine proposals that we have uh, that we expect to make part uh, of our, as a part, together, uh, our uh, substitute. And so by the end of this week, will people be able to look at one proposal oh, yeah. that says we'll spend no, this much over 10 years, this is what the CBO says it will cost, and this is what the CBO says will end up the percentage of Americans who have health insurance? We do not increase taxes, we do not cut Medicare and Medicaid, and we do not have mandates on individuals or businesses. The Republican leader John Boehner, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll ask him about Afghanistan and the evolving political situation there. We'll also ask him about Tuesday's big elections here in the United States. Stay with us. Back with the House Republican leader John Boehner. I want to spend some time on politics, but a couple quick questions first. The administration announced Friday night that it is going to make the H1N1 vaccine available to detainees at the Guantanamo Bay terror detention facility. There are shortages here in the United States for families who are trying to get them. I wonder if you think that's a good idea. I, I don't think it's a good idea. The administration uh, probably didn't think it would be very popular either. That's why they announced it on Friday night. Uh, we have uh, prisoners in my own home county uh, who are going to get H1N1 shots uh, while there are vulnerable populations who want the shots who can't get them. Uh, I just think that's wrong.
Uh, I'll ask you about the Afghan elections. The challenger, Abdullah Abdullah, has said he will not participate now because he doesn't trust the election process. As you know, the administration has said we want to see who we have and what kind of partner we have in Afghanistan before the president makes this momentous decision about troop levels. What does this political uncertainty in your mind do to the situation there and the president's decision? Well, I think uh, President Karzai did the right thing by agreeing uh, to, to the runoff and accepting the, the decision of the, the commission. Uh, but I think everyone expected that President Karzai was going to be reelected, And so Dr. Abdullah's uh, uh, exit from this race, uh, I think, really says more about the fact that he knew he wasn't going to win. Uh, but that should not hamper uh, our decision with regard to Afghanistan. The President made clear uh, that we are not going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, but they've looked for every reason in the world to put off a decision. Uh, and the longer this decision hangs, uh, the more jeopardy and the more danger our troops on the ground there are in the middle of. We've had the highest uh, casualty totals in years uh, over the last month or two. Why? Because all of the uncertainty about, around what the president's going to decide. Uh, I'm concerned uh, about this delay. I would hope that the president would make a decision and make it soon. I want to talk to you about politics. You'd like to be the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. And while most of the attention on this year's elections are on the governor's races in New Jersey and Virginia, there's a con special election in New York State. I'm going to hold up the newspaper here. This is the Syracuse newspaper. And you see one out, two left in battle for 23rd. It's the 23rd district. And the Republican Party's endorsed candidate, Didi Scozafaza, yesterday withdrew from the race. You endorsed her. She was the party's nominee, but she was she withdrew from the race after... Sarah Palin, Tim Pawlenty, the former governor of Alaska and the current governor of Minnesota, two people who might want to run for president someday, and other conservatives jumped in and said, she's not good enough. She's not pure enough to be a Republican. Can you be the Speaker of the House? Can your party survive in this part of the country if things like this happen? Well, this is a pretty unusual situation. You had seven county chairmen uh, who chose uh, Dee Dee to be our nominee. Uh, and clearly, uh, she would be on the, the left side of our party. Uh, a conservative uh, decided uh, uh, to leave the Republican Party and sign up on the conservative party ticket, uh, which is allowed in New York. And uh, what's happened over the last several weeks is her numbers have continued uh, to slide. Uh, Hoffman, uh, Doug Hoffman, the conservative party candidate, his numbers continue to grow. Uh, and so Dee Dee yesterday decided to withdraw from the race. Uh, this is a pretty unusual circumstance. Uh, that but we it, see but in New York. does it not send a signal? Your friend and former House Speaker, Republican Newt Gingrich, says if this happened, it would be a purge of the Republican Party. This is what Chris Holland, obviously he's a Democrat, your colleague in the House, he's chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. He says the far right teabag party is leading the Republican Party around by the nose. Now, uh, listen, we, we accept moderates in our party. We want moderates in our party. We cover a wide range of Americans. Uh, I've, uh, I was at the Tea Party in Bakersfield, California on April 15th. Uh, I answered questions in front of 18,000 Tea Party people uh, Labor Day weekend in Westchester, Ohio. Uh, I've worked with these people. And what they're concerned about is the growing size of government. They want someone that, who's really going to actively reduce spending and reduce control here in Washington. They're scared to death. And in this particular case, they think... Uh, that Mr. Hoff uh, was a better candidate than a Republican. If, if you are a pro-choice Republican, say in the northeast part of the country, maybe you support same-sex marriage as well, but you're a fiscal conservative and you think you're a New England moderate Republican, northeast moderate Republican, would you enter a race now for Congress next year, seek the Republican nomination, knowing that something like this might happen I, to you? I would hope so. I would hope so. Uh, because what we need is we need a, a broad group of people in our party. Doesn't this send a pretty no, this stern is, this signal? This is a people? very unusual circumstance. You don't think the people who went after Dee Dee are going to think we can go after other Republicans now, now that they've succeeded here? Well, I think that uh, going after Republicans uh, is one thing. Having a party standing on fiscal responsibility, like we have all year, standing on principle, uh, against uh, the crazy policies that we see out of Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Reid. Uh, the American people want to see us take these principled stands, and uh, they want to see us continue to offer what we think are better solutions. Now, if we can continue to do that, uh, we'll have a broad cross-section of people in our party. As the House Republican leader and the man who would like to be Speaker, how do you 
looking at what happened here. You think it's isolated. You hope it's isolated. What do you do when you're in a room with a Sarah Palin, a Governor Pawlenty, the Club for Growth, the people who attacked your party's nominee there? What message do you send to them about, I assume you'd want them to pick and choose future battles pretty carefully. You don't have much room for error in next year's elections if you want to get your ultimate goal. Well, we're in the middle, of, well, I think, of a political rebellion going on in America. Uh, and this, this rebellion is, are by people who really have not been actively involved in the political process. And they don't really care whether you're a Democrat or, or a Republican. Uh, they want to see people who are going to stand up and protect the future for our kids and grandkids. Uh, and, and so it's going to be a, a difficult road to walk uh, to work uh, with relative, relatively new entrants into the political system and, and to work with them to show them that, by and large, we are the party. Uh, who represents their interest. Let me ask you lastly, though, but sometimes does the party need to draw a line? What's the point of having a party if people in your party will attack your own nominees? I mean, where do you draw that line? Uh, listen, I'm, I'm a big believer in Ronald Reagan's 11th Commandment. Uh, 11th Commandment, never talk ill about another Republican. That was not followed in this race. I know. John Boehner, the House Republican leader, the man who hopes to be speaker, we appreciate your coverage.